Hey there, thanks for joining Stonegate Online today. We're so glad that you would take the time to enjoy Jesus with us. My name is Tony Robinson, and I'm part of the groups team here on staff. Yep, and my name is Ryan, and I'm also on staff here at Stonegate. So before we get going, uh, we'd love for you to just get to know some ways that we are just going to connect with you and you connect with us. And so still, we're in this pandemic. Man, we are. We're it keeps still going. It. Yeah, but so it? while our building is still closed. Church is wide open. Wide open. Wide open. Wide open. And so, so. we still have been trying to f- uh, just be really creative and intentional about loving thy neighbor. And so you just kind of want to talk a little bit more about yeah, what that is. It has been, uh, it's just been such an encouragement to me personally yep. to watch so many of you out there. Uh, take practical, meaningful steps to mm-hmm. loving people in our community, praying for people in yep. your community by name, and then meeting needs. And then also, I would say, uh, it was just so encouraging to see many of you out there uh, resource us as a church to yep. meet so many needs right now. I know mm-hmm. even just this last week, we've helped some people with some urgent medical needs mm-hmm. and also some utility bills that were way overdue. And so that is just one small example of many practical needs we've been able to meet because so many of you out there have been willing to jump in with us yep. on our Love Thy Neighbor initiative. Yeah, it's been so great. And so if you want to just, we'd love to hear some of those stories. Yes. So online, we still have Facebook um, and we have a group for you. So just jump into that. Yep. You can kind of hear some stories, share some stories. And so we'd love for you to follow us on Facebook and on Instagram. And we have some great things for you to jump into throughout the week. So we have our Q&A that's always Q&A there. Monday. Monday, Q&A yep. always. Devotionals that are going on. Devotionals. Prayer on Thursday. Yep. We just have a lot of stuff for you to engage in throughout for the sure. week. And we'd love for you to jump in on that. Absolutely. So another thing we have coming up is baptisms. You want to talk about that? Baptisms. Yeah. Uh, if you have not been baptized, uh, why wait? I mean, yeah. uh, I know we're in the middle of a pandemic. Yeah. But still, what an incredible thing for us to be able to celebrate that the Lord's continued to move. Yeah in the middle of even a season like this. So I think there are folks out there, there are many of you out there mm-hmm. that have met Jesus. And mm-hmm. if you've met Jesus and you want to take that next step, that step of obedience that Jesus yeah. calls us into as mm-hmm. followers of him to get baptized, we want to connect with you. So what we're asking today is go to upcoming events on our webpage, go to stonegate.church and there's a tab that says upcoming events and we will be sure to connect with you on how to get baptized here soon uh, at Stonegate Church. Yeah, and I just, I so encouraging to hear like the Lord is still in the business of saving people. Yeah, bringing really them from is. death to life. And so we want to be a part of just celebrating with you in that as you take that walk yeah. of obedience. So. Some of you, you might get saved today. So even come at on. the end of the service, after you hear the sermon, maybe you come meet on. Jesus and then you can come right on back to this uh, and, and just be reminded, go to stonegate.church, upcoming events, and we would love to see you get baptized. Yeah. Yeah. Amen to that. Yeah. yeah. So what else we have going on is, man, there's just so much to celebrate. So much. Uh, but we've had some seniors that have just graduated. And yes. so you kind of want to talk a little bit about yeah, that as well. Yeah, I'm actually wearing uh, a student ministry shirt the drop. for the, the well. Yep. And, um, and we love uh, the students here yeah. at Stonegate Church. They provide so much energy and life and enthusiasm. And our team here at Stonegate, Jeff and Daniel and Matt and Brock and all of them, they do such a phenomenal job shepherding and leading our student ministry. Yeah. And we know that this year, uh, the school year particularly, hasn't been uh, a normal one yeah. by any stretch Gosh. of the imagination. Mm-hmm. But we still realize what a monumental life accomplishment it is for our seniors to graduate. So mm-hmm. we want to just be able to celebrate with you today, to encourage you and affirm you, and to just be reminded uh, just uh, what a big moment this is in your life. Amen. And I just want to say real quick, just for all of the teachers uh, that I know mm-hmm. it's just been kind of weird and wonky, uh, just finishing out the year. Yeah. And so praise God to those teachers as well as to the moms the and moms. the parents that are just yes. doing it day in and day Stepping out. Stepping up. Man, it's just a yeah. huge thing. So we MVP. just want to... Yeah, MVPs for MVP this season. So <laughs> praise God. So man, we're so glad again that you would join us mm-hmm. uh, just for worship and just enjoying Jesus today. Our worship team is going to come out mm-hmm. and just lead us in a couple of songs. Yep. And then Jimmy's joining us. Uh, today. To preach through James. Keep Come on, on going. Yeah. We're going and through James. as we get started today, what we're going to do here at the very beginning is we just want to provide a moment of celebration yep. and affirmation and even a bit of a charge yep. from Rodney and Jeff and speak directly to our seniors. So love for you to just tune in for that video and join us as we celebrate the good news of the gospel today and also celebrate our seniors on Senior Sunday. Yep. So thank you again so much. Visitors, we welcome you. Yep. We hope you enjoy the service. We love you guys very much, and here's the video. I want to take just a moment to reiterate to this group right here how proud Stonegate Church is of the class of 2020. What a special class to lead out strong and finish in a worldwide pandemic. 
guys, this is a major milestone in your life. And as you exit the student ministry, uh, we're saying you're at a point now where you're now going to go make disciples who will make disciples. And I want you to feel the weight of that moment and how beautiful it is that now you get to leave and lead. I think to transition this moment appropriately, guys, it gives me great joy to introduce to you probably the biggest champion of our student ministry, and that is your lead pastor at Stonegate, Mr. Rodney Hobbs. Can you guys just show some silent love wherever you are right now for your pastor? Come on, Rodney, thanks for joining us. <laughs> Laura is showing some silent love back in the background right there. <laughs> Yeah, just to, uh, in some ways, just affirm uh, what Jeff was saying there about each of you. We're just so proud of you, so thankful for you. Uh, it's it's such a um, it's such a privilege to watch uh, young men and women grow up in Jesus uh, into maturity and uh, to be able to be big cheerleaders of that. So that's, that's just been such a huge privilege to do. And so much of you finding what it is the Lord wants to do with you is going to be you being willing to keep a, uh, a steady yes before him. Of uh, just putting your yes on the table and just every day in the small things and the big things, uh, saying yes to Jesus at every turn. Now with that said, I'd love to pray for you and just ask the Lord to bless you um, as you head into this next season. So Father, we are thankful for these seniors. And Father, we th we're so thankful for the grace in their life that is so evident. Um, to get them to this milestone in their life that we're celebrating right now. Um, God, we're thankful that you have seen them through, that you have um, given them the grace uh, to get here. And Father, we look forward in their life with just an eagerness, knowing that you have all parts of your hearts that you wanna open up to them and invite them into. And Father, I just can't wait to see in five years, 10 years, 15, 20, um, the maturity, the character, the, uh, the, the whole, uh, Christians that you're going to be making from this crew of people. And so, so Lord, we're just anticipating that with just such an eagerness and a hopefulness. And Father, I pray that you would give every grace in every one of these lives to uh, protect uh, that little flame of faith in them in the upcoming years, to grow that flame of faith, and for it just to burn really, really brightly in their lives. So Father, would you bless each of my friends um, on this call? And it's in your good name. Amen. Well, good morning, Stonegate. I'm so glad you're here this morning to worship with us. Um, we are just here to lift high the name of Jesus together. So we're gonna do that through singing songs together. We're gonna do that through hearing his word preached over our hearts. And right now, we're gonna start worship by just speaking praise to him. And so this comes right out of Psalm 100. So I'll have a part and then you will have a part that follows. So it goes like this. Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come into his presence with singing. Know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who made us and we are his. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. We say this together. We enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. We give thanks to him and bless his name. For the Lord is good. His steadfast love endures forever and his faithfulness to all generations. And we all say, thanks, thanks be to God. Let's sing this out together. You are the hope that broke the dark in me. You are the light that shines when I can see. You are. the sound When I can see 
believing kind. I sing this song that freedom brings. It's ringing loud. Now I am free to lift my eyes for grace is alive. You are the hope that broke. sing this worthy worthy of every song we could ever sing worthy of all the praise we could ever bring worthy of every breath we could ever breathe we live for you sing Jesus Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever say he's worthy. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you.
sing, I will build my life.
We're saying to you that we give ourselves to you because you are the maker of heaven and earth. We belong to you. We trust you, God. God, we just declare that you are our only hope. God, we are boasting today in the resurrection of Jesus, the victory that we have in him. And so because of that, we have a hope that doesn't put us to shame. And so God, thank you for that. And God, we're just asking that you would speak to us in this, this time, that your spirit would open our hearts um, to more truth about who you are. Would you speak to us? Would you ask him right now um, to speak to you in this time? We are hopeful to hear from you this morning. We love you. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Stonegate. Today we're reading from James chapter 5, verses 1 through 6. Come now, you rich, weep and howl for the miseries that are coming upon you. Your riches have rotted and your garments are moth-eaten. Your gold and silver have corroded and their corrosion will be evidence against you and will eat your flesh like fire. You have laid up treasure in the last days. Behold the wages of the laborers who mowed your fields, which you kept back by fraud, are crying out against you. And the cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Lord of hosts. You have lived on the earth in luxury and in self-indulgence. You have fattened your hearts in a day of slaughter. You have condemned and murdered the righteous person. He does not resist you. This is God's word. Well, hey, Stonegate, so glad you're tuning in with us today. My name is Jimmy. I'm one of the pastors here at Stonegate Church. And hey, if you're a first-time guest uh, you're, or you're a visitor, we are so glad that you're tuning in. If you're willing, we'd love for you to text the word Stonegate Church 
to 97,000. And you'll get a text message back on your phone that gives you a chance to fill out something we call our Connect card. It's just our way to get to know you a little bit better. We, we want to bridge the gap between this camera and your screen a, a little bit more. So please consider doing that. Uh, we would be grateful. Uh, the other thing I want to let, let you guys know about this morning is that uh, coming very soon, June 21st, we're having our uh, first baptism service in the midst of a pandemic. I'm not exactly sure how we're going to pull all that off, but uh, we have plans to do that. And if you're a Christian and you haven't been baptized, uh, this is for you. Baptism is an outward expression of an internal change. That It's, it's a way for you to say to yourself and to the world, uh, my God has rescued me. I've been Uh, born again into the family of God. And it's the first act of obedience that God calls uh, Christians to in scripture. And so uh, we would invite you to sign up for that if that's you. Uh, If that's you, you would go to stonegate.church and uh, you'd click on upcoming events and you can just fill out the baptism registration form right there. So again, that's June 21st and we would love for you to be a part of it. Uh, That's gonna be a really special day in the life of our church. Okay. Uh, We are going to get into things. I'm going to pray for us and uh, we'll we'll jump in. So pray with me right now, if you would. Father, we are uh, desperate for you in this time. As always, every time that we gather, um, whether it be Sunday, if if folks are watching this on Sunday or any time throughout the week, uh, we're saying as we come to listen to your word preached, we need you to help us see what we can't see and to soften our hearts and convict us of sin and, and change our lives. God, we want to look more like Jesus uh, as we look to Jesus. So God, would you please do that uh, today as we're in this passage? We know that you are eager to do that uh, because you've given us your son. And like we say all the time, how will you not also with him freely give us all things like the scripture says? So God, we're, we're ready to receive from you and just, just meet with us. Be kind to us in these moments. We pray in Jesus' name, amen, amen. Well, I don't know where you were, on December 19th, 1997, but I was in a movie theater with my friends watching Titanic because it's amazing. And my heart did go on to see Titanic three more times in the theaters and then to buy the double VHS when it came out. And I just want you to know that it's kind of a big deal. I love this movie and I, I'm fascinated by the story as were millions of people. Uh, it's a, a wild story. It's a tragic story. And, uh, you know, a lot of folks call it the single worst maritime disaster in history. Now, a lot of research since, since 1912 has been done to kind of make sense of what happened. Like, how did this ship sink? It, it was called the unsinkable ship. It's in the name that this shouldn't happen. And yet, it did. Now, why was this? Well, um, a lot of researchers, they're called Titanicologists, by the way. I looked this up and that's a real word. And that just made me really happy to know. But Titanicologists would say that at the top of the list of why the Titanic sunk was this, speed. Did you know that? This speed, that, that it was going too fast. So the ship left Britain on its way to New York uh, City, and it was sailing over the the North Atlantic. Now that ship was zooming at about 23 nautical miles an hour, which was way faster than it should have been, given the context that it was in. And mind you, it was in the North Atlantic, and there were icebergs all around this area, and yet it was still blazing this trail. Now there's some disagreement as to why it was going so fast, right? Um, the, but the reigning theory as to why uh, this was happening was the Titanic's captain, Captain Smith, was trying to, get this, beat the crossing record of its sister ship, the Olympic. So, so he's blazing through the Atlantic for ba- what basically amounts to bragging rights, right? That he wanted to be able to say, I got there faster than you. Now, of course, we know what happens next, right? Uh, there's an iceberg spotted. They can't turn away in time because they're going too fast. And, and the, the product of this is they collide with the iceberg. And in the course of really just a few hours, over 1,500 people either freeze to death or drown in the North Atlantic Ocean. Now, all of this, all of that, because one captain's ambition 
to beat a speed record overrode the mission of getting folks where they needed to go. And when selfish ambition overrides the mission, there's destruction every time. Now, for the past several months, we have been, as a church family, in the book of James. We've been going through it and we've been confronted with this one reality over and over. And it's this, that faith works, right? We've said it a lot. Faith works, that when a human being collides with the living God and they trust him in faith, that their life should change as a byproduct of that, that all of their life should be impacted. It should change how we, how we interact with others, how, we, uh, how our temperament is. It should change our, our planning. It should change how we handle conflict. Faith, if it's genuine, should change how we do everything. Faith Works And in chapter five, James is at it again. And this time, he turns his attention now to the theme of money and possessions. He looks at a certain group of people, the wealthy people of his day, and he calls them out for allowing their ambition to override God's mission for wealth in their life. He's saying that they've missed it. They've, you've missed the mission. Well, what is that mission? What is the mission of wealth? The answer of that, as we're gonna see today, is, is what's gonna sort of anchor everything else that we're gonna be looking at. So I just wanna put this up front for us to hold on to. Here's the main thing I want you to hold on to as we plow ahead in this text. God's mission with wealth is the flourishing of others. God's mission with wealth, with your wealth, is the flourishing of others. Now, before we start, uh, there's two things I feel like I need to say uh, at the top of this text. Uh, I don't know, call them ground rules. Okay, two things. Uh, thing one, what you're about to hear is not wrath, it's mercy. It's not wrath, it's mercy. Now, I say that because it's going to feel a lot like wrath and only wrath at the top. Uh, J- these are some of James's harshest words in the whole book. And that's saying something, right? Because James has got some, he's got some teeth, right? But, but these are incredibly harsh words. But I want you to hear this. Harsh words are not bad words. They're not necessarily bad words. The very fact that James is even calling us out, you know what that's proof of? That's proof that God cares. That's proof that he cares for you. There's mercy here for you. He cares enough about your soul and mind that he's willing to shout to get our attention. So if you feel like this is mean, I just want you to ask yourself this question. Is it meaner to yell at someone who's asleep in a burning building to wake up or is it meaner to just be silent and watch the building burn? Right, because that's, that's what's happening. You don't warn people that you don't love that this is an act of mercy and love for you. So let's remember that as we jump in. That's thing one. Uh, Here's thing two. This passage is for you. It's for you today. Now, I say that because it's gonna be really tempting not to see yourself in this passage. Um, And that's because just the opening words of James 5, right? James opens by saying, "'Come now, you rich.'" Right? And, and if you're at home and you're like a college student watching this right now, eating ramen on the futon, you, you, your ears aren't necessarily perking up like, oh, he must be talking about me, right? What does that mean? Who's rich, James? Who are you talking about? It would have been a lot easier if James would have just said something like, come now, all you who make over $150,000 a year and have less than two dependents, right? If, if he said that, then we'd go, oh, okay, he's talking about That group of people, I either fit into that or I don't fit into that, but he doesn't say that. And because there's ambiguity here, our hearts are gonna be tempted to define rich in ways that preclude us from feeling conviction about it. Like our heart is just so prone to find the caveat, find the loophole that doesn't mean that I have to engage with this text. And I don't want you to do that this morning. Hear hear this, he's talking to rich people. Yes, but rich is less about a price point and more about a posture. Does that make sense? James is addressing a heart posture more than he's addressing a tax bracket. He is addressing a tax bracket, but he's addressing a a heart posture 
posture. The Bible, it's really a mixed bag when it comes to the topic of, of wealth. There are, there are unrighteous people in the Bible who are rich, no doubt. There are unrighteous rich people all throughout the Bible, but there's also righteous rich people, right? Like, like Job or, or King David. And there's also righteous and unrighteous poor. So, so wealth by itself isn't an evil. I just want you to see that. Don't, don't forget what the main issue is. The main issue is this. Is your mission the same as God's mission when it comes to money and possessions? That's, that's what we're asking today. How do you see wealth? How, how, how do you use it? What drives you in your use of it? No doubt there are serious threats to actually being wealthy. The Bible never commends it. The Bible even says, hey, don't desire to be wealthy. It would be bad for you to pursue that. So there's, there's real threats to actually having a lot of money and stuff. But what, what I'm trying to say is you, you don't have to be a millionaire to, to be tempted to love money, right? So fight to see yourself in this passage today. That, that's what I think I'm saying. Fight to see yourself in this passage. That being said, let's jump in and let's see what God has to say to us. Looking at verse one, it says this. Come now, you rich. Weep and howl for the miseries that are coming upon you. Now I told you he's coming in hot and he definitely is here. This opening line is meant to terrify. I mean, you don't use words like weep and howl because you want people to feel cozy by saying that. You, you use those words to wake them up. Right? In fact, James is actually borrowing language here from the Old Testament prophets. This is how many of the prophets would speak when they were talking to nations that, that the judgment of God was coming upon them. They would say, weep and howl, O nations. And he's borrowing that language, this prophetic language, to talk to this group of people right here. He's pouring cold water on our faces and he's just saying, warning, right? D judgment is coming your way. Now, why is the judgment coming? Well, the whole rest of the text is James's argument. It, he's, he's bringing his case against the rich. You can think of it like a, um, like a court proceeding. James is about to give pieces of evidence to prove these people's guilt. He's saying, your ambition has overridden God's mission in two critical ways. How you treat your stuff and how you treat others that those are the two main ways that we see our ambition overriding God's mission. So let's look at the first one right now, how we treat stuff. Uh, James gives us a, a couple ways that the human heart can um, manage money and possessions in ways that they weren't designed for, right? Uh, verse five shows us one of them. We're gonna kind of jump down a little bit to see uh, the first one. Verse five, look at this, he says this. You have lived on the earth in luxury and self-indulgence. You have fattened your hearts in the day of slaughter. Now, remember what James is up to. He's, he's showing how these people's management of wealth misses the mission. Remember, that's, that's what's going on here. And the first thing we see is that we can miss God's mission for wealth by living for our comfort. By, by living for our comfort, by living large, is what he's saying. One of the greatest offenses that we can commit against God with wealth is by just burning it on our own self-indulgence, by living opulently, by being uh, primarily concerned with our own comfort, right? Th these are people who, he says, have lived on the earth in luxury and in self-indulgence. Now, what about that is a problem, right? Well, if you've spent any time with us in James, you know the answer. The problem is it misses the mission your money was made for. So think for a moment about the rest of the book of James, all the verses that we've covered up to chapter five. What kind of stuff do you see happening over and over? What kind of things is he talking about regularly? Think about a uh, chapter one, verse 27, right? Religion that is pure and undefiled in the sight of God our Father is, is what? It's to visit 
orphans and widows in their affliction, right? That, that we need to be caring about other people. Or chapter two, verses five and six, when, when we're showing favoritism against the poor in our churches, what does he say? He says, has God not chose those who are poor in the world to be rich in faith and, and heirs of the kingdom, which he's promised to those who love him? But you have dishonored the poor man. God is concerned about people who lack. Or verse f- uh, 15 of the same chapter. If a brother or sister is poorly clothed and lacking in daily food, and one of you says to him, uh, go in peace, right? Be, be warmed and filled without giving them the things needed for the body. What good is that? What, what good is that? Over and over, James gives us a sneak peek at the heart of God for those who lack and for those who suffer. God's mission for wealth is to be an aid for these people. So yes, it offends him when we use the very resources he gave us to bless others to bless ourselves. That offends the heart of God. Do you, do you remember that um, scene in that movie Sense and Sensibility? Yes, I, I know that it was a book. I didn't read the book. Uh, don't judge me. I saw the movie. In, in the beginning uh, of that movie, the, the opening scene, you have this character, John, who he's at his uh, father's deathbed and his father uh, and him are part of this really wealthy family. He's talking with his father as he's dying and on his deathbed, his dad tells him that be, because of the way the will was written, all of the wealth of this family, all of the, the properties, the, the mansion, the, the uh, land, the money, all of it's going to John. Right? And, and his father, his dying request that he makes to his son on his deathbed is this. He looks at him and he says, hey, please use the wealth that you've been given to take care of my three daughters, your, your stepsisters. Please, please use this wealth and these resources to take care of them. If you don't, they're not in the will. They, they'll get nothing. There'll be no dowry. There'll be no inheritance. Please take care of them. Right? And John looks at his father and he says, yes, I want to take care of him. He promises him that. Now, he leaves there and he's got some big aspirations about how he's going to do that. I mean, he's got in mind, man, I'm going to give 3,000 pounds to each of these women and they're going to continue to be able to live in the palace and it's going to be great until he gets home. And he talks to his wife, Fanny. And in about five minutes, they talk themselves out of the whole thing. It becomes, you know, $3,000. That's a lot of money for some young girls to have. You know, I mean, shouldn't it be more like 1500 right? But 1500 I mean, you give that all to, to one person at once and it's going to go to their head. Maybe we should give it to them in little bits, like 100 pounds, like every year uh, until, you know, they die. But wait a minute, what if they live longer than f- that would be 1500 uh, Maybe we should dial that back some too. And by the end of it, they commit to 500 pounds and they kick them out of the manor. They kick them out of their own property and Fanny and John move in to the place that those three daughters were living. This is what the, is hidden in wealth, this temptation. James is saying we can easily talk ourselves out of generosity toward others and easily talk ourselves into generosity toward ourselves, that wealth has a way of tempting us to do this. I, I don't know about you, I see this in my own heart like all the time. I remember when me and Kelly were first married. Um, do you know how hard it was for me to be talked into uh, letting her go get a pedicure, like a $25 pedicure? You know, I'm, I'm looking at numbers, I'm crunching numbers, I'm, I'm going, man, I just don't know if we can do this month. But do you know how easy it was for me to talk myself into a fourth guitar at like $2,500. Like, it was so much easier to talk myself into self-generosity than to talk myself into generosity for her. Seeing wealth as a means of our comfort misses the mission of generosity. That's what James is saying. But, but it's not only that. It also tells a lie about eternity. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, I'm, I, let me speak right now to you if you're a Christian, if you're somebody who's put their faith in Jesus. I, I wanna say this, and you should know this, this is not your home. 
Like this time and place right now, this moment that we're in, this is, this is not home for us. There is a life that's promised for the Christian. And it's, and it's not now. It's, it's a real life. It's a future life. And it's a permanent life. And that is so much more our home that Peter looks at uh, the people in 1 Peter uh, 2.11 and he says that, hey, you guys need to know you're sojourners and you're exiles in this world. That when you think about yourself on this earth right now, you should think, I'm a pilgrim. We're pilgrims. And listen, pilgrims don't build palaces. Pilgrims don't build palaces, right? Like, a, like a, imagine you and your family are uh, moving up north, okay? And let's say it's a couple days journey. And you get in the minivan and you head up that way and, you know, you spend the first night in, in a hotel. And imagine you wake up that morning in the hotel to the sound of your spouse busting up the drywall in the room, right? And you look at them and you say, what are you doing, babe? And they say, uh, well, I was thinking, right here is where the French doors would go, right? And they'd be flanked on either side by two bougainvilleas. It's going to be beautiful, trust me. And now watch this. You go inside, spiral staircase up to, wait for it, the overlook, right? And what, what, do, you, what do you say to that person? Right? You say, get in the car. What are you, what are you doing that, this isn't the destination. We're, we're on our way to where we belong. So why are you acting like this is the final stop? It's not. Pilgrims don't build palaces because we haven't arrived at where we're heading yet. So it doesn't make sense. It doesn't correspond with reality. Now, does that mean that we have to live under bridges and wear burlap sacks and go around and, with ashes on our head? Is, is that what... It means, well, no, that's not what it means, right? P poverty isn't any holier than wealth in and of itself. So don't think that way, but it does mean we need to be checking our hearts in this. Am I living and spending and building and buying in such a way that it says, this is my final destination? Or am I living and, and spending and building and buying in a way that says, I'm a pilgrim. I'm here for a little bit. And, you know, I'm, I'll take care of my family and we're, we're going to live. But this isn't home. Like, I, like I'm heading home. So I'm, I'm, a, I'm a pilgrim. Now, how you see your future will determine how you live your present. Now, you might say, well, whew, good. Uh, I've got no problem with that because that's not me. Right? That's not, I, I, there, I'm not trying to keep up with the Kardashians. Like, that's not a temptation for me. I don't, I don't have the diamond rings and the Bentleys. That's, that's not uh, the draw for me. Well, I just want you to be careful because James has another critique here for us. See, there's one more dysfunctional way to engage with money and possessions. One, one way is by looking to it for your ultimate comfort right? By living large, like we just talked about. But, but the other way is, is by looking to it as our ultimate security, as our ultimate security. Uh, look at verses two and three with me. <laughs> he says this, your riches have rotted and your garments are moth-eaten. Your gold and your silver have corroded and their corrosion will be evidence against you and will eat your flesh like fire. This is a picture of, of someone who hasn't burned through all their wealth and, and stuff, but instead they've, they've amassed it and they've, they've hoarded it, right? It's become for them a, a kind of security blanket. One of the other temptations of wealth is to hold tight to it, right? To cling to it, to see it as my security. And while the Bible doesn't call saving a sin, in fact, it commends it in the book of Proverbs, it does tell us that hoarding and, and amassing and stockpiling our wealth while the world around us is in need, that that thing, that's a sin. And it's just not how our stuff was intended to be used. And James tells us the problem with this approach is this. Your wealth won't last. It won't last. Notice what's happening to their stuff 
in this verse. Uh, your riches, what, have rotted. Your gold and silver has corroded. James is saying, hey, your stuff is impermanent. It's going away. In fact, it's so impermanent that he chose past tense verbs to describe the stuff that these people currently own. He said, hey, th- it is so certain that this stuff is going away that right now we can talk about your riches as having rotted already. That's how certain this thing is. Now, why is it? Why won't it last? Well, James gives us the answer. He says this, You have laid up treasure in the last days. You've laid up treasure in the last days. That phrase, the last days, it's a a biblical term. And it's a term to describe the time between Jesus' first coming, his uh, his birth, his life, death, burial, resurrection, ascension, 2,000 years ago, that moment that happened, his first coming, and his second coming. When he, when he comes to close out history, when he returns as the, as the judge of all the earth, that space in between those two moments is called the last days. And I don't know if you know this or not, but that's how the Bible talks about the time we're in right now, that me and you are operating right now in the last days. And on that day, the whole earth, You, me, everybody is going to have to give an account for how we handled the resources our king, our master has loaned to us. And Jesus tells us repeatedly, hey, that that day, it's not like a zillion years from now. It's coming soon. It's right around the corner. I'm standing at the door. You see, there's an expiration date on your stuff, on, on our savings, on our security, like really, really soon, guys, really soon, this part of the story is gonna end and you and I will be facing the master giving an account for how we stewarded what he gave us. See, this is why you you don't have to be on MTV Cribs or like own a yacht to be guilty of mishandling wealth both ways of handling wealth, whether it's seeing it as our ultimate comfort, like we talked about, or by seeing it as your ultimate security, both of these ways are forgetting that our life is temporary. We are in the last days. Both ways forget that we'll be held accountable by Jesus himself one day. And and both ways keep us from God's main mission of our wealth to deploy it for the good of others. We see this so clearly in James's last piece of evidence that he gives these people, how we treat people. This is his last uh, point here. And look at verse four with me. We're gonna look at verse four and six together. How we treat people. Behold, the wages of the laborers who mowed your fields, which you kept back by fraud, are crying out, out against you and the cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Lord of hosts and then down at verse 6 you have condemned and murdered the righteous person he does not resist you that's heavy and (laughs) at first blush it it might be hard to see yourself in this verse right not a ton of us listening right now could, could relate to this. These are clearly people who've got like some serious means. They've got servants, right? They've got laborers. They've got harvesters. Have you ever had a harvester? I haven't had one of those, but these people do. These are people at the top of the food chain. And what they're doing, he says, is they're defrauding their employees. They're not paying what's rightly due to these guys and girls. In verse six, it goes on even further to say that they've actually condemned and murdered these people. I mean, this is some severe stuff. And you might go, well, thank God that's not me, right? I don't have these kind of problems. Well, maybe not. Maybe not, but don't miss this. Remember what I said at the beginning. But before we have a, a tax bracket problem, we have a heart posture problem, right? That that's the main issue that we need to deal with this uh, today. And there is a broken way of thinking about the world and our place in it that James is rebuking right here. And to to help you see what it is, let me put it in the form of a question. This is a really clarifying way to kind of get a sense of where your own heart is at with wealth. 
Here's the question. Do you see people as agents of your flourishing? Or do you see yourself as an agent of their flourishing? Right? Do, do you see people mostly as agents of your flourishing? What, what can you do that can improve my quality of life? Or do you see yourself as an agent of other people's flourishing? This is the question behind all of this, behind everything we're talking about. Are they here for me or am I here for them? If people are mainly here so you and I can flourish. Well, then verses four and six, they actually make a lot of sense, right? Like, these folks want to take my hard-earned money. I'm not, I'm not going to part with that. I don't think so, right? I, I refuse for you to be an obstacle to my happiness, right? That's what these rich people are saying here. But see, when you understand what the real issue is, it's a lot easier to see how you and I can actually be guilty of the exact same attitude in maybe much more subtle ways. Let me give you an example. Okay, so I, uh, in high school, I had my guitar stolen. Uh, from the trunk of my car. And it was a nice guitar. And I had to replace it because I was the worship leader uh, in my youth group and I was playing at weddings and things like that. And I needed to replace it. But guitars, it cost a lot of money. And so, you know, I didn't know exactly what to do. I was kind of racking my brain. How do I get the resources to buy this? And then it hit, hit me. I knew exactly what to do. It was actually a really wonderful idea. In fact, it was such a good idea. It was so gonna secure for me that guitar I wanted. I was so confident in the brilliance of it that I went to my youth pastor one night after buying Bible study, and I said, hey, Ben, I got it. I figured it out. I just wanted to let you know that, that the Lord has shown me the way uh, for how I'm going to get this guitar. I'm going to take the recording software I use, and I'm going to make copies of that software, and I'm going to sell that off for money to all my friends. And after I do that, I'll have everything I need to get this. What do you think? And I'll never forget what he said. He looked at me, And he said, Jimmy, you only get one story with everything you do. Do you really want this one story to be that in order to get the guitar that I'm going to use to lead worship with, I pirated illegal music software and sold it to my buddies? Or do you want your story to be, I waited on the Lord and he provided a way. And now I'm able to buy this through honest means. And, and I got to tell you, I, I had no idea. I, did, I, I couldn't see it at the time. But you see what the problem was, right? Like my, my heart in that was essentially saying, I'm going to look at other people as mechanisms in order to help me flourish, right? It, the, the, the problem with my heart is I wanted to cheat people out of money so that I could get what I wanted. I saw them as agents of my flourishing. And, and we all do this, right? We do this in, in, in subtle ways, in big ways. Uh, the, think about like undercutting folks in your office or slandering people in your office so that you can kind of work your way up the, the corporate ladder and get some upward mobility there. Or think about maybe you're a student. Think about what plagiarism is. What is plagiarism? Plagiarism is not crediting someone else's work so that you can benefit from the work, right? Or uh, just uh, giving lousy tips, right? Uh, you, you know what drives me crazy? It's just Christians who like go out to dinner and then they like stiff the guy after it's over, you, you know what I want waiters and waitresses to say when they serve a Christian table? I want them to say, I want those guys back at my table. You know, I feel like a lot of times they probably say, geez, that was the worst. Please never again, those people. Why are we not tipping? Because, because we see them as obstacles to our flourishing. That's my money, right? That, that's my money. Or, or how about this? Not even thinking like one time about purchases that I want to make for me, like a new iPhone or a new car or a new house, not, 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 not even questioning it, right? But, but then all of a sudden, really wrestling with the implications of giving $30 a month to a missions organization, right? Like, how, how's this going to work month to month? I don't know how it's, it's going to happen. Hold on, let me, let me check my iPhone 90, right? Like, the, this is what our heart does over and over, and all these things scream out, you people exist for me, 
for my flourishing. And this is poisonous. And God hates this. And he says in verse four, and the cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Lord of hosts. Now this is the only time in the whole book of James, where he refers to God as the Lord of hosts. I wonder if you know what that means. That term, Lord of hosts, is actually a a military term. And it means the Lord of armies. The Lord of armies. That the general of heaven, he sees injustice and he is rallying his armies against you. That's what he's saying. That's how seriously God cares about people. He literally goes to war with those who work against the flourishing of others. And that's the last place anyone in the world wants to be is at war with God. Do you see that? This text is meant to make us ask, just in light of that what do we do? I, what do we do? I don't want that, right? That's, that's, that's so heavy. That's, that's the destruction of, of me. Like, what do I do when I see that my selfish ambition constantly overrides the mission of God? My heart is constantly doing that. And, and God's saying, like, he goes to war with those people? Like, I don't want that. What do I do? Well, if you're asking that, I'm glad you are because there's a great answer to that. What do we do when we see our heart constantly overriding the mission of God with our resources and our wealth? What do we do? Well, the answer from scripture is this. We gaze at the photo negative. Now, what on earth does that mean? Gaze at the photo negative. Well, I don't don't know if you thought about it like this, but the gospel gives us a picture of the exact photo negative of this passage here in James 5. You remember what a photo negative, right, is? It's a, uh, you know, it's like when, it's a picture of the image, but it's where all the, the colors of that image are reversed. Blacks are white and whites are black. In the gospel, we get a photo negative image of James 5 because in the gospel, you have the story of the wealthiest person that's ever lived, the ultimate wealthy person who doesn't just own some stuff, like I got a property over there, but he owns all stuff. He made all stuff. That person, you see him let go of all his wealth and all his acclaim and get as low as he possibly can to bring about the flourishing of those around him. That's the gospel. Listen to the words of Paul in Philippians 2. He says this, Jesus, who, who although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped or held on to, but emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant and being made in the likeness of men, being found in appearance as a man. Listen, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross, that's as low as a person can go. That's as much as a person can let go of their stuff for the flourishing of others. And Jesus got that low, and why did he do it? Why, why that kind of death? Here's why, that by taking on our sins on himself, you and I could eternally flourish in his presence forever. Listen to how 2 Corinthians 8 verse 9 puts it. It says it like this. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor so that you by his poverty might become rich. Jesus is the ultimate expression of working for the flourishing of others at the expense of of yourself. He is the photo negative of these people in James chapter 5. And in the gospel, as we, as we trust him, as we put our faith in him, he puts that same mission-minded heart inside of us. That's what he does. And so if you're hearing this today and, and, and you're, you're feeling like, 
man, I see that I'm, I'm broken in this area and I wanna know what to do. The answer is not, well, hey, here are these 19 principles that you need to get behind and you need to start acting on. It's, it's not exactly like that. That's never changed a human heart to just knock out a bunch of to-dos. Our heart is what's broken in this. Remember that. So the answer is, instead, we need to draw near to Jesus in faith. We need to gaze at that photo negative of the gospel. You, you look at him and he begins to change your heart so that as you watch his love for you, as you see his generosity to you at the cross, you become more and more of a generous person. As you gaze at him, you become more of a you uh, before me person, right? The mission of God for your stuff becomes your mission as you gaze at him. What we do is we watch the infinitely wealthy Jesus spend it all on the cross to make us his, and then we watch our life start to change. That's how God intends to make us on mission with him. And no one who does that ever has anything to fear. That's good news. That's good news. Let's pray to that end. God, will you make us like that? Would you make us people not like the rich here in chapter five? God, will you make us people like Jesus? The opposite of that. Someone who, though he had it all, spent it all, came and died for us to rescue us, to create permanent human flourishing in our lives, to give us everything. God, would you make us more like him, our big brother Jesus? We, we need that kind of changed heart. And so we're saying we need the work of the Spirit in our, in our life. So Father God, would you allow the Spirit of God to work in us in such a way that that we trust Jesus more, that we look to Jesus more, that we admire Jesus more, and, and so become changed into his image bit by bit every day. God, we don't want to be hoarders. We don't want to live lavishly. We want to walk as pilgrims in this world, God, but it's hard. It's hard. We're so oriented to ourselves. God, would you help us to, to live in such a way that says, I exist by the grace of God to live for the flourishing of people around me. And God, where our hearts don't want that, will you change us even this morning? We pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. My life is not my own To you I belong I give myself I give myself to you Sing it out my life is not my own To you I belong I give myself I give myself to you Yes, we do, Lord My life is not my own To you I belong I give myself I give myself How good is it for us just to be reminded of how good the Lord has been to each and every one of us? In fact, it is because we want to continue worshiping and reminding our souls just how good God has been to us, we are going to enter into a time of offering. 
And as we do, I just want to say, if you are new to Stonegate or you just came upon our online service, feel no obligation whatsoever to participate in this part of the service. In fact, we're just so glad that you tuned in today and we would love to serve you in any way that we can. But if you call Stonegate Church home, this is such an incredible opportunity and moment for us to continue to worship God and also to see his work go forward into our community in this season we find ourselves in. So there will be a few different ways that you can give generously that will come up on the screen. And as they do, let me pray for all of us. Lord, you have been so kind to us that you've met all of our needs, that you continue to rain blessings down upon each and every one of us. And Lord, would you expand our hearts that we would see all the blessings that you've given us and all the ways that you've continued to provide for us. And Lord, make us big-hearted, generous, joy-filled people like you are. In your name, amen. We are so glad that you joined us today. And in fact, if you want a little bit of a bonus edition of our service, as soon as we're done with our benediction, we have a special surprise for you today. Uh, a lot of our seniors uh, made a video uh, that we want to show you as soon as uh, the benediction is over, just uh, introducing themselves to you and also just a way for us to celebrate and be excited for them and to hear their names and to know where they went to school and what's going on in their life. So it's a couple minute video that's going to play right after the benediction. And I'd really encourage you to stay tuned and to check out that video. As we get ready to have that video come up on the screen, let me uh, have you stand where you are. If, you, if you're right there in your living room, just go ahead and stand for our benediction as we speak a blessing over all of us as we go throughout our week uh, into wherever the Lord would have us go this week, that we are good news ambassadors to share the gospel. And our benediction is from number six this morning. It just says, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and may the Lord be gracious to you. And may the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and may he give you peace. We love you, Stonegate Church, and check out this video right now from our seniors as we join them in celebrating their milestone moment of graduating. Genesis Bay's Midlothian Heritage High School. Colton London, Waxhatch High School. Julie McClellan, Midlothian High School. Abby Chernowski, Heritage High School. Marcus Dennis, Midlothian High School. Jacob Cole, Homeschooled. Carson Austin, Maypro High School. Connor Ward, D. Maypro High School. Laura Perez, Midlothian High School. Haley Pollock, Midlothian Heritage. West Wright, Midlothian High School. Sophia Shabrasi, Mansfield High School. Eric Brown, Midlothian Heritage High School. Ian Holtzen, Village Tech High School. Cedric West, Heritage High School. Jordan Kiefer, Ovilla Christian School. Jada Dodd, Maypro High School. Mariah Thompson, Grand Prairie Fine Arts Academy. Diego Velasquez, Midlothian Heritage. Cambry Berry, Maypro High School. Claire Wilkie, Homeschool. Christina Hurd, Mansfield Legacy. Olivia Rodriguez, Midlothian High School. Hermeson Owens, Maypro High School. Dakota Dodson, <laughs> Maypro High School. Colby Holloman, Red Oak High School. Olivia Parker, Newman International Academy. Seth Bodder, Alvarado High School. Olivia Walton, Midlothian High School. Libby Stiphoffer, Pantigo Christian Academy. Kayla Stanford, Maypro High School. Yasmin Johnson, Newman Cedar Hill. 